Hello everybody, this is uh, the maintainer's track uh, for six scheduling updates. Um, my name is Aldo Kukikondor, I'm a software engineer at Google. And I'm Kensei from TechTrade, and building some service mesh stuff. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, SIG Scheduling is uh, the special interest group uh, responsible for the components that make pod uh, placement decisions. Um, of course, uh, our main uh, mandate is to uh, maintain the cube scheduler, but uh, the, the SIG as a whole has a number of sub-projects. Uh, today we're gonna talk, other than cube scheduler, we're gonna, going to talk uh, about Q, Quark, and the cube scheduler simulator. Uh, so we'll start with the scheduler, of course. Uh, the scheduler, uh, cube scheduler, is uh, the component that makes the decision about in which node each pod should run. Uh, and that's based on a number of, of properties like the, the, the pod spec, the, the node properties, and the utilization of, of these, these nodes. Um, the, um, the scheduling, uh, this is the, the overall picture of how the scheduling looks like uh, internally. And it, it, it's roughly divided in, in, in two or three stages, depending on how you count. The first stage uh, is the scheduling cycle, which actually makes the decision. Uh, the, you know, it's the compute, the computation of which node uh, each node, each pod should go to, and it, it goes through a number of stages. Uh, the, the, the important ones here, the, the most important ones, let's say, uh, are, are the filtering uh, and the scoring. Filtering, uh, it's very simple to understand. For each node, we calculate a yes or no answer, whether the pod can run or not in this node, uh, like depending on the node labels, the, the utilization, and so on. Um, and uh, later, we uh, do a scoring, which uh, implements some kind of preferences or optimization rules, such as like spreading and so on. Um, so that's the scheduling cycle. After that's concluded, we have a decision made uh, then we proceed into the binding cycle, which in simple terms tells the API server what our decision was. Uh, this, because this is a communication with the API server, it happens asynchronously so that uh, we can use the CPU again for the next scheduling decision. Um, more recently, we added uh, another stage, which we call pre in queue, uh, which allows us to um, which allows actually external components, external um, uh, operators in the Kubernetes system to uh, weigh in into, uh, into when to start the scheduling. Uh, for example, Q uses the, the scheduling gates uh, to, to do uh, some, some decisions before the scheduler, and once it's, it's consider, it considers that the decision is ready, it removes the scheduling gate and then uh, the cube scheduler takes over. Um, so yeah, so a number of, uh, all of all of the features that you might know and love from scheduler are implemented as plugins, and these plugins implement each of these stages uh, to, to make the decision. And, uh, and also it's extensible so that if you have your custom scheduler, you want to implement your own rules, um, you can use this same framework to implement those uh, dedicated uh, decisions. Um, now we'll dive in into a few features that we recently worked on. All right, so before diving into the enhancement topics, I'd like to a bit talk about the overview of the, our you know, recent activities. So in Kubernetes Schedule, so the performance matters. So it is very important because the scheduling cycle, as Adol said, uh, schedules parts basically one by one. Uh, so, it, uh, when your cluster gets bigger and bigger, and at some point, the, the amount of created pods might go beyond the scheduling throughput, right? And so, that's the worst case scenario that we want to avoid, and we have a dedicated, I mean, a certain goal for our scheduling throughput, and try to keep the threshold, I mean, uh, sorry, throughput in every scenario. And therefore, uh, so the, in the in the recent 
with its cycles, we've been focusing on the performance improvement more than you know adding new features. And uh, the recent enhancements that I I will introduce today here are mostly about the performance. I mean, the DOA is kind of uh, exception, I guess. Uh, but so here we have the first enhancement, uh, queuing hint. So when you when your part get unschedulable, uh, so what could make your part schedulable? So thinking about it, um, what makes parts schedulable is the some change in the cluster. Uh, so we call any change in the cluster the cluster events in the scheduler. So with the cluster events, uh, we mean any you know resource operations such as uh, you know, node is created, uh, portal is deleted, and volume is updated, etc. So we call all those uh, like operations the cluster events. And let's see how the scheduling queue handles those events and make the decision of withdrawing part. So if the part is rejected at the scheduling cycle, it comes back to the queue with the note about which scheduler plugins rejected this part. So in this example, um, looks like the part is rejected by the resource fit plugin, which is the plugin that checks each node's resource and calculates whether this part can go there or not. Uh, so in this example, looks like, yeah, probably there's no node that has enough resource to run this part. And so each plugin registers uh, the cluster events that could solve their scheduling failures. So in this example again, uh, the resource fit plugin, uh, their failure could be solved by a new node is added, node is, uh, existing node is updated to have more you know, allocatable capability, or the, any you know, running part is deleted. So the resource fit plugin registers those events. And here, so when the scheduling queue observes node add event, for example, uh, which the plugin registers, uh, it withdraws the scheduling of the part. So this is how um, originally the scheduling withdrawal works. But thinking more about it, uh, not all, you know, not all node addition can make this part schedulable, right? Because, uh, for example, what if this new node is super small and cannot run this part? So here, a queuing hint comes in. So queuing hint is the feature that allows scheduler plugins to filter out uh, cluster events so that queue, uh, the queue uh, can determine when to withdraw more um, wisely. So in this example, uh, the scheduling, uh, the resource fit plugin has a queue hint to check whether this new node is big enough for this part's request. And if yes, then we try this part. And if no, it's uh, the queue would ignore this event. So queuing hint helps in you know reducing the unnecessary scheduling which wise, which allows us to increase the um, throughput overall. So here's the history of queuing hint feature. So, yeah. Uh, so this feature was initially proposed by me and I remember by Patrick as well at, at the almost same timing. And uh, both, of, both of us proposed this, yeah, the similar feature uh, around enhancement of recurring and I wanted this feature for the scheduler in general, and he wanted this feature for the DOA. And so we implemented this feature, yes. And so along, uh, so at 1.28, uh, we implemented some, a few queue hints as, you know, experimental, experimentary. Uh, but the users reported the memory leaks and we disabled the feature immediately. So that's what happened at 1.28. Yes, and afterwards uh, we kept 
you know, working on implementing queuing hints in other plugins. And at 1.32, we finally finished comp uh, implementing all queuing hints in all entry plugins. Also, we identified and fixed the uh, memory, memory leak issue. And also, we put the effort uh, for the integration test and scheduling performance test coverage a lot. Yes, so at 1.32, this feature will be enabled by default again. And yeah, let's see. So the next one is the async preemption. So if your parts get unschedulable, uh, they may go through the preemption process before going back to the queue. So as, you, as some of you may already know, uh, the preemption in the scheduler is the, is the process to allow uh, high priority parts to delete some lower priority parts so that it can go to the node. Uh, probably next time. So in this case, uh, this high priority pod wants to go to this node one by deleting some pods there. So the scheduler deletes those pods so that this pod likely uh, go to there in the next scheduling cycle. But the problem here is that um, when the preemption is triggered, the scheduling cycle takes time to complete uh, which impacts the whole super negatively because uh, the preemption has to make some API calls, right? Uh, to delete some parts. And given the preemption happens within the scheduling cycle, uh, the scheduler waits for you know, all the API calls to complete and then finish the next scheduling cycle. So that's the problem we wanted to solve. And this enhancement uh, literally uh, tries to run these API calls asynchronously uh, to decouple them from the scheduling cycle. So when, uh, when the scheduler decides to delete some parts on node one, it reserves the place for this uh, high priority part on node one. And the scheduler just starts the next um, scheduling cycle without waiting for the API calls to be done. So given we made a reservation for the pod, so the next scheduling cycles take uh, this ongoing preemption into consideration and you know, don't, basically don't steal the place on node one. Right, so here's the notable updates in the scheduler. So we graduated some features uh, like uh, pod scheduling, readiness, gates, graduated to GA, mean domains for um, pod topology spreading, graduated to GA, um, match level keys in pod affinity and anti affinity graduated, graduated to beta. And also at 1.32, uh, DOA structured parameters graduated to beta as well, and classic, classic DOA was removed. Um, we we didn't go through the array in detail this time, uh, but uh, if you want to learn more, there is the working group serving presentation later today. Yes, uh, so if you want to learn more, please go to that session. Uh, well, now uh, I'm going to focus on Q, another uh, sub project of six scheduling. Q is a component that can be added to Kubernetes that works with the Kube scheduler and the cluster auto scheduler to uh, allow you to build a, f a full batch or training system. Uh, Q makes uh, the decisions of whether a job or a workload should wait or should run uh, based on a number of uh, characteristics. Uh, in Q, you can define per tenant quota, so you have multiple users. Each user can have a dedicated quota uh, for, for, for them, but also uh, whenever your users are not using the resources, you might want to share. Uh, you might allow other users to borrow those resources so they can, um, uh, you can have a, a, the max, maximum utilization of your cluster. And with that comes the need for preemption that is aware of these uh, uh, quotas. 
Um, in version 0 0.7, uh, released a few months back, uh, we added fair sharing rules so that this, uh, whenever you, you are borrowing, uh, the borrowing happens uh, fairly based on some, uh, some weights. Uh, in version 0 0.9, which was released last week, uh, we added uh, hierarchical uh, concepts to, to, to queue, so you can not just define users, but teams and teams of teams and so on, and you can uh, give um, uh, qu dedicated quotas to them as well. Uh, in 0 0.9, fair sharing and hierarchy are exclusive to each other, but in the, in the in the future versions coming soon, we'll, we'll have fair sharing uh, for, the, for the organization. Uh, Q doesn't necessarily work with pods as Cube scheduler. Q makes decisions at a higher level, uh, so it will uh, decide either groups of pods or, or different APIs, such as the job API, job set. Uh, we also integrate with Kubeflow, with Kuberay, uh, but if you have your own uh, mechanism your own API, you can also use the library to integrate with Q. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of Q here because we had a presentation yesterday, so if you want to learn more, there is the link there. Um, but uh, I want to highlight two features. Well, fair sharing is the, the um, one of the most important features we added. Uh, when you define a cluster Q, you have your quotas, but the, what is new is the fair sharing uh, weights. So in this case, we uh, we have two users uh, sending jobs, and uh, and one of uh, the third user went on vacation, so um, um, there, she's not using all her quota, her assigned quota. So, uh, but um, uh, we can see that uh, there are roughly uh, six uh, slots left, and these uh, users are sending a lot of jobs. Uh, but because there is were uh, fair sharing and there is a weight. Uh, we can give uh, two slots to uh, the first user and four slots to the, the user that has a, sh a bigger weight. Um, so that's fair sharing. Uh, fair sharing also works in, a, well, it will, it will work in a hierarchy. Uh, the, the, in a hierarchy, what you want is uh, if, you, um, if you have, if you're borrowing resources, uh, you, uh, if you allow if you have unused resources, uh, you want those resources to be used by your uh, subtree first. So let's see uh, on the left side, you have AI innovators. You want those, uh, un what, whatever is unused on, those, on that side needs to be used within the subteams first before le uh, allowing borrowing to other subtrees. So in, in this example, there, there are two uh, jobs coming in from the AI innovators, innovators side. We need to decide which job should run first because uh, which job should run first to allow uh, to uh, satisfy fairness. In this case, um, backpropagators is borrowing less right now, so it, it's the one that's going to be selected for running. But if there is no space in the cluster, we need to select a victim to, uh, for preemption, and then in that case, we uh, select the the path in the tree that has the highest utility, the the highest borrowing. So in this case, that would be uh, this part on red. Um, and Q also works in, uh, mul in a multi-cluster environment. I hope you, you saw the, the, the keynote in the morning at, uh, with CERN. Uh, so if you missed it, there is the link there for you to watch it later. Um, so that's Q. Uh, another sub-project very popular these days is Quok. Uh, Quok means Kubernetes without kubelet. Uh, it is a toolkit to uh, set up a cluster, uh, a, a simu simulate a cluster with thousands of nodes, uh, but in, in seconds in very, with very few resources, you can run it on your laptop. Um, and why would you do that? Well, you, you might want to simulate uh, scheduling decisions. So you, you can bring your own scheduler or, or configure the cube scheduler in different Ways with different weights for the for the plugins, and you want to simulate what will happen. Uh, so that's where Quok comes into play. So it, it kind of looks like a real cluster, but there is actually just a controller uh, acting as if it was multiple kubelets at the same time. Um, so what's new? Um, 
So uh, the community has, has, has been working on improving the stage API to allow for easier, easier simulation of normal and abnormal behavior. Normal behavior would be well, the, 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 op, the pod is running. Abnormal could be maybe you're having restarts or the pod crash and, and failed, uh, things like that. So that could be useful information for your schedule, scheduling simulation. Um, also, they have been working on the uh, adding, improving the experience of simulating metrics from for CPU utilization, CPU memory utilization that can be also used for uh, your scheduling decisions. Uh, also, now there is a Helm uh, chart available, and they've been working on CLI, CLI uh, Quark CTL. Uh, now supports macOS and Windows, and it also supports more runtimes such as Lima and Finch. Uh, container runtimes, uh, and they have a, f a number of features in the roadmap. Uh, they they are getting ready to uh, graduate to Alpha 2, uh, and they are uh, trying to use the, the enhanced experience of Quark uh, and uh, extend the simulation, uh, the, the usage uh, simulate usage usage metric simulations for GPUs and other custom metrics. Uh, so very exciting work uh, in Quark. Um, yeah, I, w I will recommend uh, this project if you are looking to um, to simulate uh, um, scheduling decisions. Um, All right. So the next one is the simulator. So Kubernetes scheduler simulator literally offers the simulation of scheduling. So it offers the debug ability for your custom scheduler. Well, not necessarily custom scheduler. So the scheduler is uh, composed of the plugins that, like uh, Aldo mentioned at the first, and the simulator visual visualizes all the internal decisions from those uh, plugins for its part scheduling. So it has a web UI like this, and you can, you know, create some resources on that, and it shows all the program decisions like this, maybe too small. Uh, so it shows like uh, this program returns something at future, and this program do something and whatnot. So regarding the simulator, we initially uh, we initially uh, supported the simple, you know, web UI based simulation only. Yes, so, but we've been, you know, improving it so that you can utilize it for more use cases. And, yep, uh, 0 0.2, we migrated the internal Kubernetes, Kubernetes API server uh, into Quark, and at 0 0.3, which is released, and this summer, I think, uh, so we introduced this uh, syncing feature to the to the simulator. Sorry. So testing a scheduler is hard because uh, there are so many parameters on each resource, and you know which that th that makes you know tons of scheduling scenarios, right? And it's difficult to cover all the scenarios within your integration tests, and also the scheduler in your you know uh, production environment is a lot busier than. Uh, your development clusters, and you often end up finding a bug only happening at the production cluster. So the syncing feature uh, keeps, no, this is the feature, like uh, keeps importing the resources from your production cluster to, sh to simulator, so that you can simulate your uh, scheduling uh, at your production environment, but without breaking the production environment. So, yeah, so it allows you, like, for example, test a new version of your custom scheduler with the cross, the, your production cluster's resources, but, you know, before actually deploying it to production cluster, yeah. So, and at 0 0.4, so we introduced the uh, standalone debugable scheduler. Uh, this version is just released, I mean, the last weekend. 
So it gets, I mean, uh, the debuggable scheduler is the scheduler that was used internally in the simulator before, and it schedules parts like the normal scheduler, but it also outputs all the scheduling internal, you know, decisions from each plugin as pod annotations. So basically, the web UI that we saw just visualize the decisions that is written on pod annotations. That's how, you know, basically how the simulator works. So the simulator and this uh, debuggable scheduler was tightly connected before, and yeah, so, you know, it means it works, uh, it worked only inside the simulator, but we decoupled this uh, debuggable scheduler from the simulator, and now it works standalone. So for example, uh, you can use it in the development cluster, uh, instead of the normal your scheduler, so that the debugging, you know, debugging the scheduler there would be easier. Yes. All right, so it's the end of the session. Thanks, everyone. So we can hear your questions or any concerns, whatever. There are a couple of mics at the back. Yep. Thank you very much. I didn't see descheduler on the list of uh, subprojects. Is is that uh, because that project is more or less static? Is it because required during scheduling, uh, required during execution has finally been solved? Um, we, that's the first project we discussed today. Uh, descheduler. Oh, descheduler. Yes. Oh, yeah. sorry, I didn't hear you right. Um, yeah, um, the descheduler. It's, it's been pretty stable uh, for the past few years. Uh, there hasn't been like major features, that's why we, we didn't highlight it, but it's still an active project, uh, actively maintained. Um, I think the latest uh, overhaul that we presented in the last KubeCon uh, was really uh, about um, the, the scheduler framework, which basically mimics what we did for the scheduler into the descheduler so like people can implement their own custom descheduler's um, yeah that's i think the major highlight in the past let's say year but other, other than that like there's been work uh, on man, um, you know like maintain, maintenance work um, I, have a, I have one question here um, i'm just wondering are there any plans to add um, some kind of uh, a NUMA pod affinity or anti-affinity for pods the way that we have node level pod affinity? Um, it's being a topic. Uh, I think uh, right now probably the working group device management is is uh, kind of discussing the alternatives. Because the, now there's DRA which can potentially be used as a NUMA scheduler. But I think there are other ideas floating around. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I would recommend you to bring this question to the device management working group. OK, uh, thank you. Yeah, I have like a, I mean, a different use case maybe. Like uh, I saw the Q project, right? And uh, um, I, I saw that like you can def uh, define different resource flavors uh, for batch jobs. Um, the the thing that I want to do is maybe um, create my own uh, scheduler for maybe machine learning models to be scheduled on pods. It, can Q be adapted for that? Because I think you told me that it works with Kubeflow and um, uh, Ray as well, uh, Cube Ray. So, can we adapt Q to work for scheduling models instead of jobs? Is that possible? When you say models, um, are you talking about like mm, tasks? Uh, yeah, uh, like I mean, let's say I want to serve a model and I want to schedule that on a pod. Um, your, the queue okay. basically does job level scheduling on, I mean, 
or preferential job scheduling on nodes, right? Uh, but let's say I have pods, but I want to schedule models on pods instead. Can Q be adapted for that, or like, I mean, um, or is that not the use case that we're trying to solve here? Yeah, Q, Q, Q's focus right now is batch, like training. Right. Um, we are working on, on um, let's, what we call mixed workloads, so allowing, uh, allowing both serving and training to, to be run in the same cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the serving right now, like, yeah, like deploying models, wouldn't be something that goes through Q. Like Q only cares about the quota and how many resources you're using, uh, but not what is inside the, the pods. Um, however, uh, we, we were discussing on Monday with uh, uh, Signode and, um, and the working group serving uh, about the possibility of kind of uh, defining the idea of tasks uh, that can be scheduled to, to pods as like as containers. Uh, we're calling for now. We're calling that uh, discussion uh, as dynamic pods, um, but it's still very early. We don't have a specific plan yet. Uh, yeah, there is too many ways to do it wrong, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. So, but those discussions are happening right now. It's uh, working group serving. Okay. Um, yeah, as you can see, the, the AI craze has spun three different working groups <laughs> that uh, uh, are focusing on different areas. But we all come back to the same table at some point uh, to to bring the features to to Kubernetes. But yeah, so that's that's being that discussion is happening in working group serving right now. Got it. Thanks. Um, hi. Uh, so I have two questions that are sort of similar. Um, thanks for the great talk to both of you, by the way. Um, my question is specifically for Kensei. Um, I like the queuing hint feature. Um, the way I understood it, it makes sense that we don't have to go through the whole same sequence of um, the whole workflow of the scheduling decision again. Once the node joins again, you can just apply that queuing hint. Um, I guess my, my first question is, is the main benefit the latency that we save from not having to go through that entire scheduling workflow, or are the other benefits be beyond that? Sorry, what was the question again? Um, so I have a specific question regarding the latency. Uh, but before I, I asked it, um, like when we're making a scheduling decision, you mentioned in the presentation that one of the benefits is the time we save in terms of making that decision, that you, you don't have to go through the entire scheduling workflow again. Is that correct, right? Yes. Uh, uh, I was just asking out of curiosity, are there other benefits in, in that change? Um, I have a second follow-up question, but I'm just curious if that's the main is that was the main benefit and motivation for the change, to, to have that latency improvement. I, I can give a try, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe I can answer from some real work code uh, use case. For example, if you're running on EKS, and you don't have the control on uh, controlling on what's the max back off or something of like that, mm -hmm. so one, uh, Issue you may see is that if you have different tier of priorities, the higher priority if you submit job of 1,000 part, and then you may hit a very classical scheduling problem called HOL, head of line blocking. And then that's because if you're running even on a uh, cluster, auto scheduling enabled cluster, then maybe a new node will, will treat, okay, all the high priority part which are unschedulable will get retry, I retry again. That, so that your low priority has no ch fair chance to be scheduled mm. any, anymore. So that is uh, just blocking all your customers' users. So that is, instead of latency, this is a functional benefit that you can have. And we want to resolve this. So with the scheduling hint, then a new node, yes, is auto-scaled, -scale, but it doesn't fit the high priority job. Then the high priority job will still be in the back off without being retry and retry a churn the cluster again. So that's a, another non-latency uh, benefits. So. Oh, okay. Um, nice. Um, that's, that's helpful. Um, part of my follow-up question was actually answered, so I'm, I'm addressed fully. Thank you. Yep, that, that was way also deal for this, this scheduling. 
Hi, uh, we've got a fun little project that auto scales deployments that are blocked uh, by PDBs when there's lots of evictions. Uh, but it uses like a webhook to watch evictions now, and it's a little bit janky. We kind of wanted to talk to some SIG about that, and we couldn't really figure out who owns evictions uh, and that sort of stuff. Is that scheduling or apps? I had a, somebody point me this direction, but looking for kind of higher level guidance. Um, evic depends. <laughs> um, for uh, priority, priority evictions, which we call preemptions, that's six scheduling. Uh, you mentioned PDBs, is that yeah. correct? We, we want to know about failed evictions. So if a PDB is blocking an eviction saying you can't evict that, we want to be aware of that so we can either have an operator mutate the workload or just a general thing, auto scale deployments. I think that's still us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there is some shared responsibility with CGAPs, but. No, what? not yet. So the pod's still running, the PDB is keeping it alive, but it's getting lots of evictions because we're trying to clear out a node or something like that. Wait. Yep. Wait. wait, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, in that case, the pod is not physically deleted Correct. because it's gated by PDB. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the best chance you can have is checking the audit log of API server, which is usually by default, no matter what kind of cloud, cloud, uh, cloud offering you have. So check the audit log and see which uh, party just issued the deleting or eviction API on the pod. There should be some log there. Is the, but the, is the audit log really available to operators and other controllers in a No, that way? is, uh, you have to have the cluster access. For example, for EKS, you'll go to the console or something, uh, check the logs. So if I wanted to make it more available to see failed mm -hmm. evictions, like mm -hmm. would that be a suggestion for apps, for scheduling? Mm. Like I just don't know kind of which signal. I don't think there is a native integration, like exposing like nice API for the operator to call. Yep. Maybe you can build some adapter to expose some, for specific for your purpose, okay. as this kind of thing, right? And with that, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks.